Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast with Kevin Harrington and Seth Green. Kevin Harrington is the inventor of the infomercial, one of the original sharks from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and has generated over $5 billion in TV and digital direct response sales. Seth Green is the world's first trusted authority on cutting edge direct response marketing, a best selling author, and the only three time Marketer of the Year nominee. On the podcast, Kevin and Seth interview sharkpreneurs who share straight talk on what it takes to explode your business. Why do so many businesses struggle while others seem to explode overnight? Do you wish you had the secret to this type of exponential growth? Now, I've scaled more than 20 businesses to over $100 million, and it's not just luck. In my new book with Mark Tim, Mentor to Millions, you'll learn the repeatable framework I use in all my business ventures for massive success. Order at KevinMentor.com and get over $1,000 in bonuses. Head to KevinMentor.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is your host, Seth Green. Today, I've got the good fortune to be joined by Eric Huberman from Hawk Media. They are your outsourced CMO. They've got a team of CMO level experts who have successfully grown over 4,500 brands of all industries, sizes, and marketing backgrounds. Eric, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Let's go back in time a little bit. How'd you get into the business? Uh, it depends how far you go back, but I would say uh, built and sold a couple of e-commerce companies, uh, was working on the brand side, and then just saw how broken the marketing ecosystem was. Like, Still to this day, I've sat in rooms with, you know, small startups, entrepreneurs, as well as like Fortune 500 and 100 CMOs that don't seem to understand the concept of like marketing should be driving enterprise value for the brand and revenue and growth. And all the other stuff is kind of vanity. And so this like, you know, the, the term performance marketing gets thrown around a lot. But I think like in the actual definition of it, most people don't understand it. They don't understand how to drive, have marketing drive performance of the company. And I got sick of trying to find people that did. So I just built my own little SWAT team to do so. And then it grew and 250 people. And over nine years later, here we are. Well, I am sure that the longer version of that story okay. uh, could probably be in a book somewhere if it isn't already. Yep. Let's go back a little. Let's unpack some of that answer. So sure. when you decided to grow, as you called it, a SWAT team, what was your vision? What did you have in mind originally? Yeah, there. that's actually, I always like to share that. There was no vision. It was, this is broken. I'm going to fix this. So it wasn't like, I'm going to build the premier marketing agency. And now people ask me what the vision is. And I say world marketing domination. Um, you know, it's, or excuse me, marketing world domination. Like now I realize like this is a huge problem and there's so much white space that I, I still feel like, you know, the sky's the limit. When I started, it was just like these few companies I'm advising for are having problems. I saw the problems with my own companies too. So I'm just going to solve this for these guys. Like it wasn't this bigger picture thing. And so that's how it started, honestly. And I think that people get a little too tied up in the, you know, big vision, you know, all we could, you know, the addressable market, like they even talk about it, you know, Shark Tank has a lot of drama, but at the same time, they talk about like, don't come in here and tell me what the total addressable market is. Like I'm going to capture 1% of the market. It's mm -hmm. like, you got to go bottom up. How are you going to get one customer, then three, then five. And like that kind of thing, not, the market's, you know, $5 trillion. And if I can just get 1%, we're all billionaires. It's like, stop. And so I kind of started organically the same way. We're just like, all right, this is working. Let's start growing. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I know you talked about the difference in performance, but what was the issue you were, the core issue that you said, you said, this is broken. What was broken that you originally wanted to fix? Uh, that 99% of marketers are full of shit and don't know how to actually market anything. Like that is sincerely what was frustrating me. It's like, I'd talk to people and they'd say things like, oh, we can run your Facebook ads. And I'm like, okay, what are you doing on Facebook? They'd be like, oh, well, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get you a uh, 10 times ROAS. It's like, yeah, okay. Doing what? Because on retargeting, super easy. On new top of the funnel acquisition, a little more difficult. How much scale are we talking about? Like, when they, they just throw around these numbers that they, there's this little, there's a still the same community of like these charlatans that like to preach that they can, you know, make everyone a billionaire, even though no one seems to actually be that surrounds them. And, uh, and that was already coming to fruition 10 years ago when I was starting this. And it was just crazy to see how many people sold themselves as great marketers that really didn't ever know how to build a business. 
And uh, that was the original thing I was trying to solve was like th these poor founders trying to navigate this world. Like I'm trying to figure out how to grow my business. I need someone that knows what they're doing here. And everyone says they do. There's no regulation. There's no license. There's no test. I just have to trust them in a few of their references. And it's just this quagmire of really annoying processes to try to find a great marketing partner. And I wanted to solve that and make it really easy to find great marketing. Awesome. And how did you, cause you've done it. How did you do it? Uh, I mean, it's start, it's funny. People always say like, what's the secret to starting a great agency? It's like, well, step one, know how to actually do marketing. Like I'll get calls from, and I hate to do it cause I like to encourage young people, but at the same time, I'll get a call from 17, 18 year old saying, Hey, I want to start my agency, but I don't know how to do Facebook ads yet. So where do I start? Where do I learn so I can start an agency? It's like, no, 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 no. Don't create an agency unless you're the best at something. Like if you're by nature, if you're going to sell someone your product or service, it needs to be the best product or service they can get, or you're scamming them. Like that's my view of it. If you're not one of the best in some way, that could be the best for the cost. That could be the most cost-effective, the most efficient, like there's a lot of bests, but you have to be one of those, or you're actually doing a disservice to your customers by selling them to work with you. And so to me, that's, it starts with like actually knowing what you're doing. And then we started there. And then what really took it off for me was I'd already built and sold two brands. So like when I went to other brands, I was like, you want to do what I already did. I'll just show you my playbook and oh, look, my playbook works over and over again. And now it's actually a book, the Hawk method. So it's like, this works. So let's just keep doing that. And it's 10 years later, it still works very well. And so, you know, it's a general thesis around marketing. It's not doing the same execution on Facebook, on search, et cetera, but it's like the overall principles of marketing that we use to govern how we, or how we work. Uh, we basically started with a basic framework with some experience and some credibility and just started growing. And then we were successful with our clients and then the reputation took off from there. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense. And I love the rant. I love the position, the, the flag you're planting. And I think it's fascinating. Um, and, and I've said this before, how you've said, if you're not the best at something, if you're not amazing at something, you shouldn't be starting a business that does that. And I fight with entrepreneurs all the time who think, well, I like X, so I should start a business around it. Like the world doesn't need another coffee shop. You know, if right. you're going to do something totally different and unique and Starbucks. Well, and that's, I mean, else that's a good example, though, unless you're in a town that only has Starbucks and nothing, you know, artisan and there's people that want something other than Starbucks, like then there's room for it. Like, that's a good example. But yeah, you're right. Don't go to Venice, California, where there's a coffee shop, every other store and start another one. Like probably not worth it. Right. And don't be the guy, the new guy in the BNI chapter who says, oh, well, I, I, I ran some Facebook ads for myself or something. So I might be in a basement, but I'm now starting an agency and I'm now an expert and give me like five grand a month. Yep. And oh, if I just get a couple of clients, I'll be making a fortune and can work a couple hours a day and live the dream. Yeah, that's what everyone thinks. And then it lasts for six months and they go, oh, wait, this is hard. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's, I mean, 250, talk about the makeup of those 250 people on your SWAT team. Sure. Uh, I don't know. What, like, ca what categories do they fall into? Like, that's probably easier. Yeah. I mean, so we have an overall, you know, it's the whole company. So at this point we have a sales team, a marketing team of our own, uh, you know, accounting team, HR team, um, t IT team. So we have all that. And then we have, you know, basically four departments, so to speak, I would say. Um, it would be our strategy and data department, our creative department, our life cycle department, and our media department. And then those break down in media is, you know, Google, Facebook, TV, radio, podcasts, affiliate, Amazon, wall, you know, marketplaces, uh, podcasts, I know radio, I feel like I'm repeating and skipping ones, but there's a lot in there. Oh, of course, TikTok, Reddit, Pinterest, et cetera. But um, and then life cycles, email, SMS, chatbots, a lot of that side of things. Creative is web design, graphic design, production work, all that. You know, obviously, as I mentioned, data strategy. So it breaks down to a lot of different services in that sense. And 250 people, I'm assuming they're not all in the same location. How do you manage that big a diverse team? Yeah, you know, it's funny. So we are starting to go back to office like everyone else. I, I saw the announcement, I think it was this morning, Zoom is going back to the office. And it's like, oh, there you go. <laughs> um, you know, it, it for a couple of years, we went we went remote when COVID hit. Um, we My business partner had always talked about the desire to do so. And that was the opportunity to be like, all right, well, we're here. So by July of 2020, we told the team not to worry about where they were. And we told our hiring teams, hire wherever you want. 
And so now we're in 42 states. So we're all over the place. Um, I would say for the most part, people do their work. And if they have a sort of, how do I put it? Like a precise amount of work to do, like they have to do their work and the job is done, it's done kind of thing. It works great. It's more of the opportunity cost of the people that, you know, when the job's done, they might've spent another hour being proactive, going into other stuff, finding, you know, like the sales side of our business where we're there, it's like that next phone call, that next meeting they could go on. That's where it gets a little harder. Plus training new people is a little harder as well. So that's what we're exploring now is maybe refocusing onto a few territories, not cutting anyone. Like we, the cat's out of the bag. We, we have some great people that are remote and they work great remote. As long as their numbers are great and they're delivering, we're actually not worried about it. But going forward, I think we're going to be building back in person in a few places, not just one. Right, right. <laughs> Understood. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see businesses and brands making now, other than not knowing what, let's assume the ignorance of just not knowing what you're doing is out of the picture. Yeah. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see those brands making in terms of their online or digital marketing? Yeah, you'll find every entrepreneur and every finance bro wants to quote Charlie Munger, be greedy when others are fearful until everyone's fearful. And the past year and a half really highlighted that for me. So in the past year and a half, we had this weird economic situation where people were trying to anticipate a recession for a year and a half that kind of came last year, like technically with the GDP decline, but hasn't come again. And the market's back up to almost normal and everything's been, looks like it's in a decent spot. And now you've got Morgan Stanley saying, oh, never mind. I know we said there was a recession coming, but we don't think there is anymore. And during that period, the companies that leaned into it did great. But we watched so many companies, like even in our own industry, like we didn't do great because everyone was saying cut everything and we're a very flexible partner. So a lot of people are cutting back. We didn't lose a lot of clients. We just lost a lot of spend. But that's kind of to my point. So many people got scared and played scared, even though their data and their numbers. And the same thing happened when COVID hit. We saw a lot of people when COVID first hit, pull back on everything, cut expenses, cut marketing spend. And those people missed out on the biggest business opportunity in the past, I don't know, 50 years in terms of like how much money was pumped into the economy and how many other companies skyrocketed because of it. We had furniture clients pull back on, like literally cut most of their spend in the beginning of COVID. And then the ones that didn't had the biggest, like doubled or tripled their revenue. Like it was just insane growth. And we're talking about sizable companies. I'm not talking about startups. These are big companies that went huge because everyone started furnishing their houses again during COVID. Um, so what I, the biggest lesson I've learned recently is watching this is, yeah, you have to be pragmatic. You, you don't want to put yourself at risk, but pulling back when the data doesn't tell you to do that because CNBC or the news tells you to do that is a really dumb thing to do. And, I, and I'm shocked as to how many private equity people, VCs and founders watch too much news and then make decisions off, you know, this sort of sensationalism of it. Absolutely. I'll preach into the choir here. Amen to that you've worked, your team has worked with thousands and thousands of brands. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from both your successes and your failures along the way? Because nobody's perfect. Yeah, I'd say that I'm definitely not the arbiter of what's successful. Like, but, and we make a point of that. Like, I do not try to be the gatekeeper. Like, I don't think that's going to work. And I think that's going to work because until you test the market, you have no idea. Like, I was, I always say this because it was a very humbling experience. I was offered to invest in the first round of uh liquid death you know the water company yes and i was like death water like that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard who's going to drink death water that was what i said and i admit it openly like you want to say about mistake i, I think it was a five million dollar valuation now it's i think a 700 million dollar company so like oops um we have a few of those we also have some winners in there too so we're okay but that, that that's an example of like i don't try to the same thing happened with a company called milky it was uh five hour energy shot to help women produce breast milk. And I'm like, who's going to buy a little shot that helps you produce breast milk that you know your baby's going to ingest. You have no trust. They had TN Tamara from Sister Sister. And I was like, that's not enough. Like I'm not, in and it launched and it crushed it. So I've learned a few times that like, I don't know. It's hard. No one can predict upfront. And that's why it's also hard to me for me to invest in consumer brands until I see traction too, because there's this X factor that's really hard to predict. I've also learned, um, the other way with what we know works really well, so many companies think of marketing as advertising and they just throw more and more money at advertising getting out there and they don't do enough on merchandising, on life cycle marketing, meaning again, email, SMS, content, all the things that keep your customers, keep them coming back. They don't focus enough about that on that. And like, that is how you make advertising pencil. 
is creating that lifetime value side. And so I'm I'm talking to some of the biggest Fortune 100s out there that don't even focus on that. And it's just crazy to me about retaining that customer. They're constantly trying to find new customers or bring them back through advertising, which is the most expensive way to do so. The first party data conversation, like some of them are having it like it's a new conversation. It's like, I've been doing this for 15 years. Where have you been? Like I've walked into several massive companies that don't have an email marketing strategy, which is as any consumer knows is crazy. You get emails from all your favorite brands, but not the biggest ones. Like when's the, you know, and I'm not going to name them, but think about the biggest brands you engage with. And when's the last time that they were specifically emailing you? They don't, they don't have, most of them don't have that strategy. And that is baffling to me. You are absolutely right. hundred percent on that one. Your passion is obvious. What do you like best about what you're doing? Uh, this, I'd say two things. One growth is uh, like, I'm a, that, if I have one addiction, thankfully I'm not an addictive personality, but one addiction, it's growing things and watching growth. So the ability to grow my business by growing other businesses and growing everything is really fun. So that engages me, but I'd say the biggest thing is sandbox me. And that's how I've defined it. It's learning new things every day. It's, you know, for me as running this business, it's having to stay on top of like the newest innovations in marketing. But then we realized I realized eight years ago that AI was going to be something to displace what we do. So we started building it. We launched our own AI tool, Hawk AI, uh, a year ago or almost a year ago. And uh, and now building that out and having that be an augmentation. We started our venture fund almost five years ago to invest in all the new technologies coming on the scene. But I also had to learn venture and how to manage a fund. So that part then, you know, and again, building software with the AI piece. And M&A, we've bought 11 companies at this point. And like, I don't come from that background. I have no idea how to do that. And let's figure it out. And still to this day, we're kind of like a new problem comes up or like a new request from a seller or something. And it's like, let's work through it. Like the biggest thing I've learned through all this is no one's that smart. Everyone's figuring this stuff out. And so I've taken a lot of stabs and it's allowed me to like constantly learn. And that's where I get excited when I'm working on a new project, a new initiative, something that could really be a game changer for the business. That's fun for me. Well, you've achieved an incredible amount of con- of success for both yourself and more importantly, for your clients, for our folks who are watching and listening and want to learn more, where is the best place for us to send them to learn about you, Hawk, and the AI company? Yeah, so hawkmedia.com and you can click Hawk AI, so that's easy. So that that's great. If you want to learn about the company, I'm on every social at or slash Eric Huberman, pretty much an open book. So always happy to connect there. All right. Well, this has been Seth Green with Eric Huberman. Eric, we greatly appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for watching or listening. We will talk to you or see you next time. Do you need money to fund your idea, product, or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet, and it's yours for free. Just text PITCH to him right now at 727-888-2100. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free Perfect Pitch Cheat Sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer. 49 faces looked to him in triumph. Over the last 12 months, they had each taken turns and promoted his business for a week at a time, driving over $987,342 in revenue. What if you had a network of 50 centers of influence who promoted your business every week for a year? Grab your copy of the number one Amazon best-selling book, The Ultimate Guide to Growing Your Business with a Podcast, at 33% off the Amazon price by going to ultimatepodcastbook.com. Again, that website for 33% off the Amazon price is ultimatepodcastbook.com.